Hi there. I'm Sonny Fox, and today, Joan and Jimmy and I feel kind of like the uh, Three Musketeers being surrounded as we are by this swords play going on. We're going to find out about this ancient sport of swordsmanship. And right now, in front of us, we're watching a very exciting match taking place in fencing foils. We're at the Fencers Club on East 53rd Street, and uh, we're going to find out about this ancient practice right in the shadow of some of the most modern skyscrapers. As a matter of fact, the, the UN building is just about a block from here. We're going to meet some of these fencers, some of these uh, very fine fencers and champions here uh, in a little while. Right over here, uh, Jimmy, uh, you see two of the very best. Uh, now, this gentleman over here, the tall one, is uh, Mr. Jose de Caprillis. He's uh, formerly captain of our Olympic team in the past Olympics in 1956. So he really knows his way around here. And he's going to show us some of the things we should know. Mr. de Caprillis. Hello, hello. How are you? Fine, thank you. This is Joan, and this is Jimmy. Hello, Jimmy. Joan. Nice I to see you. Winded. Oh, I should say, I've just been fencing a terrific fellow. He's deadly with that point. Well, now, before we get too much further into fencing, uh, I want to clear up one thing. Joan is under the impression, that, or was under the impression, that dueling was uh, almost identical with fencing. Well, no, not quite. You know, the duel is a dangerous and sometimes fatal combat with a sharp-pointed weapon very much like this. This is the rapier, which was used by the musketeers. In times when men would duel to defend their honor or to defend themselves against highwaymen. Now, there's quite a difference between those two blades, as you can see. Oh, oh. Do you know what highwaymen are, John? Yeah, Jim? Gonna ask you, it's for thieves. That's right, that's right, robbers. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, you see the guards, the difference in the guards? This is a big, heavy thing, this is a very light, small one. And the blades. One is very thick and broad, and the other is kind of thin and quadrangular. Yeah. But there's quite a bit of difference up there at the points, too. Yes. They sure are. This one sort of has a, another shield on it, and it's blunted. Mm -hmm. And this one is a pointy one, and you can really get hurt. You're right. That one. And you know, in order to learn swordsmanship, to stay alive, they develop fencing, which is nothing more than sword play with blunted weapons. And uh, these men would continue with these things forever and uh, skewer each other and so forth. But eventually, the duel became outlawed. It was nobody was doing it anymore. And we had left fencing, which we know today. Well, how, many, wonderful sport. how many weapons are there in modern fencing? Well, we use three. This foil, a saber, and an epee. All right, well, let's take them one at a time. Now, your partner seems to have kind of disappeared, so uh, yes. can we find another foil match going on? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, there's another match up there, and I think maybe it'd be fun to see it. Yes. Well, that we're watching. On this side, we have Harold Goldsmith, our Pan American champion. And he's been fencing with Marietta Penshart, one of our very good women fencers. Never knew that women really enjoyed fencing. Oh, Did yes. It? They're very good. And they have their own championships, even. Guess that makes me eligible for, to be a musketeer also. Sure, why not? A right. woman musketeer? Maybe D'Artagnan wouldn't approve, but I think we will. He I think we'll around, accept you. Right. No, he isn't around anyway. That's right. Well, they are using um, the uh, foil, and I've noticed that in their match and in your match, it seems to me that they were aiming at a very limited area of the body. Yes, that's right. In foil, the target has been limited. The trunk of the body is the only vulnerable part. The head and the legs and the arms don't count. Just you have uh, to make touches with the points. Just about like that. Mm -hmm. Now, because it was a preparation for a duel, you see, 
They had to learn accuracy and control of the weapon. And of course, the trunk of the body had all the vital parts to attack. And they didn't have masks in the early days, so by restricting the target, it made it a little safer to practice. Well, now, these rules that you've been discussing here, it seems to me, uh, I've heard a lot of other rules, and also seems to me that the whole sport of fencing is governed by not only these rules, but by uh, a great number of rituals. Well, yes, I suppose you could say that, but the rituals are nothing else than the common courtesies of the sword, which have been handed down to us. The rules, yes, we have. In order to learn to defend and attack properly, we developed rules which we call the Convention of Right of Way. Right of Way, now what would that be? Well, it might be a little complicated to explain, but perhaps we can show you. Now, for instance, Harold is going to attack Marietta. Now, that's the attack. Having done so, he has what we call the Right of Way. And Marietta is put under an obligation to block that attack by pushing his blade aside in a parry. Once she does that, then she has the right of way and may, in turn, thrust at him. Now, since Harold has been parried on his attack and Marietta has gained the right of way, Harold must assume the defensive again and parry her attack before he can, in turn, thrust again. Let's see that slowly. Now, here it goes. Harold makes the attack, and there is the parry, see? And he has resumed the defensive. And he has resumed the defensive. And he, now, having resumed the defensive, he can attack. So it's attack, defense, attack, defense. Yes, like a conversation in blades. Are there any other kinds of parries besides knocking oh, the blade yes. aside? <laughs> now, for instance, Marietta has a lot of alternatives. You just saw her block a blade with a side parry. Now, on the next attack, when Harold comes forward, she'll parry with a circle, taking the blade out with a mo circular motion, you see. But Harold is not uh, at loss there. He can deceive that parry and still score on the attack. There he deceived it and set, you He's see. He's just gone around her. Exactly. Now Marietta, in turn, can make two counter parries and catch him on it, you see. There's the second one, and that takes it out. Now that can build up into a tremendous combination I uh, imagine there are all kinds of parries and variations. And yes, what if we can see of some of them in, uh, in uh, fast motion? All right, you please. Well, you know, it's funny. I know what we're looking for, but I can't see it. Can you, John and Jimmy? I mean, it's, the details are really yes, lost because it's so fast. Yes, it is hard to follow because it is fast. You have to get your eye accustomed. Now, a little while ago, on another match, as we passed down the floor here, we saw some uh, jewelers or fences really, uh, slashing as well as thrusting. Oh, yes, that's the saber. You know, the, the rapier with its sharp point was not the only combat weapon. Horsemen would fence uh, and duel with sharp blades that had a cutting edge. In fact, Napoleon's cavalry was very effective with this. Uh, you, you've, you've seen movies, that's right, even of our own Western cavalry. Yes. That's right. And so in the 19th century, the practice saber took its place along with the foil in the fencing schools of Europe. Now, here we have Mr. Abram Cohen, a former national champion, and he was fencing with Mr. Nita Kirchner, a fencing master. Okay. Now, may I have your blade, Abe, please? Now, look at this. The foil. The guards are different and bigger. Yes, that's right. This is sort that's of in a triangle, the blade. Yes. This is a square. That's right. You see, the guard is bigger to protect the knuckles against the cuts. And the blade itself is a little bit shorter than the one in the foil. And uh, the triangle is because there's supposed to be a cutting edge on the thing. It's see? supposed to simulate the actual combat yes. saber. That but it's still use. a light weapon, you see. Mm -hmm. How about the area of the body? Is that identical with the foil? No. In this weapon, we've increased the target. You can also hit the head and the arms as well as the trunk. Not the legs because they're not too vulnerable when you're on horseback, you see. And, and also, we saw them slashing. Does this mean there's a more of a way to make oh, a point? Oh, yes. But I think better uh, would be if we demonstrated. Fine. Yeah, good yeah. idea. Now, now here is an example of the head cut. That's right. That's now we get one. With the cutting edge. Right. Now he's going to cut the arm. Like that. And as in foil, he can make point attacks the same way. Because that also is valid, see? And then you can draw your opponent up with a feint of the head and cut him on the flank. See? 
Or you can draw them out of position and, and cut on the chest. Paint head, cut chest, you see. There are an infinite variation of this thing. Seems to me with the blade coming at you both at the point and on the slash, this would be a very difficult uh, kind of a match. You'd have to be very fast to block that blade. Oh, yes, you do. And later on, you're going to see that in a real match. But the, the wider target and the fact that we can cut has made the play in this much wider and easier to follow for the spectator. However, the spectacular real match which these two gentlemen will put on will be a little later. First, I'd like you to see the third weapon, the epee. How does the epee differ from the saber or the foil? Well, it has an unlimited target. And uh, it's a thrusting weapon, not like the saber, it's more like the foil in that respect, you see. Now here is Mr. Robert Driscoll, a former national champion. And he was fencing with Alfred Scrovish, who is an Olympic star. As a matter of fact, this is Scrovish. Matter of fact, Mr. Driscoll is also the president of the Fencers Club, and I'd like you to meet him. Bob, will you meet Joan and Jimmy and Bye. Sonny? Why don't you come over here? Yeah. Jimmy, it's very nice to see you. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to have you here. I hope you learn to be fencers. Well, uh, certainly we can learn anywhere. We can learn here with the experts yeah, you have yeah. around. That's right, and I hope you'll enjoy yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. May I borrow your weapon? Certainly, Joe. Now, now there's the foil, and there's the epi. The guards, the guards are bigger. They're almost uh, the same, though. You're right. This looks like a triangle also. Well, it is a, a slightly triangular, but more important, it's a rigid blade, not flexible like the foil. Hmm? Yes! Uh, yeah. I'll show that it's a little different than both the saber and the foil. How about the target area? Is that different? Well, yes. With this heavier weapon, we've made the target unlimited. That is, you could hit the toe, or the top of the head, or the hand, anywhere at all. The only like thing that counts, them. exactly, without the danger. Now, we don't have the conventions that we do in foil. No right-of-way? No right-of-way. Ah. The only thing that matters is who touched who first. <laughs> Shall we show you? I'd like to see it. Well, this one, I'm surely going to back up. <laughs> you see? They feel each other out a great deal more in this weapon because there's so much more target to defend. There's a nice shot. You know that they don't uh, close distance too much here. Yeah. Now that's what we call a flesh. You know what the flesh is? That's the frame for arrow. And that's what I the think idea that's the part is, that the know, sword ran through. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Something else again. You know, it's interesting to remember, John and Jimmy, while you're watching this great sport here, that it all started with a very deadly kind of uh, thing. Thank you very the dueling. Much. Thank you. Yes. Uh, dueling was uh, really uh, for keeps, you know, and out of it has grown this very magnificent sport. Where did, uh, where did dueling start? Well, you know, we've talked about the rapier, but actually fencing has many other ancestors besides the rapier. And I'd like to show you some of them. Fine. You know, the cavemen probably were the first to duel when they started swinging these big clubs at each other. Of course, Clumsy, but probably Yes, effective. and I wouldn't say that was very good fencing. But then they discovered iron, and they started using heavy weapons and uh, wearing very clumsy, wow, heavy geez. armor, you see? Tremendous. <laughs> For instance, right. armory table. Yes. He sure is. That's right. Now, for instance, here is a mace. All of these things came from the Metropolitan Museum, you see. And there's the real authentic mace. You want to try that? You know, it looks something like in storybooks, the king and the queen used to hold these. Well, I don't think they well, held, uh, exactly. probably held a ceremonial version uh, of this. I think you mean the scepter, but it's yes. shaped a little bit like it. I think you're right, this except they didn't swing at people with it. Yeah, but if you did, you'd really uh, feel it. <laughs> yes. feel it indeed. Now, here's another one. This is the broadsword, Jimmy. Let's see you try Ooh, that, huh? That's tremendous. How do they hit each other with it? <laughs> Well, I don't know. I guess they were pretty strong, you know. They must have been men in those days. Well, it looks like what Sir Lancelot used when he saved yeah. Lady Guinevere. But I'll tell you something. All of this was no good at all when one, when gunpowder came along. Because gunpowder made the armor obsolete, see. Then the lighter weapons began to appear. But you know what? The musketeers got their name from the fact that they used to carry a musket. 
Well, in all the movies I see them in, they have swords. Yes, that's right. Because, you see, the musket could only fire one shot at a time. And then it took a long time to reload. So, in the end, they still had to rely on their swords. They always won, too. Well, I'm afraid they wouldn't against a modern fencer. Why not? Well, techniques change and improve. For instance, in the early days, they used to have the sword only for the offense and would use this type of dagger to defend themselves. So they'd stand sideways and circle each other rather clumsily, really, yes. until somebody got the idea to be able to use the sword for both purposes. When that was done, they could stand sideways, offer a smaller target, and then they could move around much faster, you see? And as swordsmanship was developed, fencing schools began to spring up all over the European continent, and fencing masters became very famous. Well, I bet you nobody plays hooky from that school. No, I guess I not, because that was, uh, as I say, for, for real. They were learning how to defend themselves against brigands and robbers and thieves. So they learned their lessons well, or else they probably didn't survive long. That's right. And you know, the nobles would uh, hire these fencing masters from Spain and Italy and France to teach them their own special secret thrusts or coups. And sometimes they would even teach these behind closed doors they were so secret. Mm -hmm. But today, the fencing master teaches us and concentrates on teaching us how to win fencing matches like the Olympic Games. Now you have a, a very fine fencing master right here at the club, don't you? Oh, we certainly do, Michel Allo. I think you've met him. I, indeed I have. And as a matter of fact, he's a trainer of a world champion and is giving some lessons to some future champions. Maybe you'd like to take your lesson with him. Okay. Great. Great. All right, I'll see you later. Okay. Bye. 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 Always we start the lesson with a salut. Alors, le salut, one, two. Put your mask on. On guard. One, two, three, four. Hello, Sonny. Hello, Sonny. Pardon How are you? This is Joan and this is Jimmy. How do you do? And as you see, they're all ready now. They've got their uh, okay. uniforms on, ready to join your class. Perfect. Uh, you start first to take the mask. This is yours. Yes. Jen. Jen. Now, the four, but before giving you the four, I want to give you a good advice. The first thing a French of most known is to never pick up a four unless both he and his opponent are completely protected. Yeah, in other words, wearing the masks or the... the Jacket and gloves. Mm -hmm. See? You see, this is a, it's a weapon that's uh, used for sport, but you have to have respect for it. All right, are they ready to join the class? All right, let me introduce you to the, to the class. Here is John, here is J uh, Jimmy. All right, in your place, please. Well, we start with a salut. He's together. I better put on your masks, John Jim. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, that's right. All right. Alors, le salut, one, two. Now, I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. When I say step forward, you do one step forward, beginning with the right foot. All right, step forward. Good, step forward. Good. When I say step back, you do one step back, beginning with the left foot. Step back. Good. Now, extend the arm. Lunge. On down. Perfect. You know, step back. Uh, actually, if that middle boy there will move over toward me a little more, I think everybody have more room. Ah, move over, Joe. Way, that's Jim. Right. Okay. That's perfect. Bon. Now, exit the arm. Lunge. Good. En garde. You recover. Rassemble. Salue. One, two. Well. Take some waste. That's perfect. Gee, Sonny, that was fun. And it was really exciting. Thank Monsieur Allo. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yes, if you keep on taking expert if you keep on keeping, taking expert instruction like that, you'll be able to be a very good fencer pretty soon. Thank you, Michel, and thank You're you, welcome. ladies and gentlemen. Now, we're going to see that saber contest, you know, over there. We'll see this real contest with exciting sabers right after this word about another CBS television show. There's another wonderful trip coming Wednesday evening when that world traveler, Lowell Thomas, will invite you to go along with him for a high adventure in remote and little-known countries of Africa. Join him on the Sahara Desert as he rides to meet the world's most savage fighting men, the Tuaregs, who wear blue veils to keep evil spirits from entering their noses. With Lowell Thomas leading the way, visit the pygmies of the Belgian Congo and look in on their strange witchcraft ceremonies. 
Go to the big game country of Kenya, and then meet more black magic in Madagascar when you'll watch an eerie dance of the dead never before seen on film. It'll be high adventure all the way, from Timbuktu on across the desert to the jungle. High adventure with a man who's spent a lifetime exploring the world's strangest, most colorful corners. Join Lowell Thomas next Wednesday when High Adventure will come to you over most of these stations. Well, Joan and Jimmy, now we've seen the three types of fencing weapons there are. Do you remember what they are? I think the foil, the saber, and the egg. Wonderful. You are marvelous. Now we want to see the saber match. Now you're going to see that saber match, I promise you. You know, the world championships are going to be held in Philadelphia the last two weeks of August, so we thought we'd put it on the way it'll be held there. First, there's a jury, very distinguished jury. Let me introduce you to them. Colonel Henry Breckenridge, Assistant Secretary of War and former captain of the Olympic team. And then Mr. Eugene Blanc. He's a famous, famous attorney and president of the French hospital. Then Mr. Tracy Jekyll, a distinguished furrier and on the Olympic team many, many times. And then Mr. Alex Solomon. He's a manufacturer and a very distinguished fencer. And then finally, Miguel de Caprelli is captain of the 1952 Olympic team and a law school dean. And your brother. Guy. And my brother. That's right. <laughs> now, actually, we'd have all these judges in the championship That's match. That's right. All right. Now that we have the contestants, you have met them before, Mr. Abram Cohen on that side and Mr. Nita Kirchner on this side. Okay. Now, they start saluting each other and the judges. They always huh? salute themselves and the, jur and the jury. Are you, you notice that Cohen is rather tall and he'll rely on his reach, while Nita Kirchner is short and will rely on speed. Mr. Cohen hit with the point, and the score is one nothing. The director always points at the person. Back to this side. Now the score is one all. The touch is on the arm. See that? Mr. Nita Kirshner with his speed finally got inside and hit Mr. Cohen. Mr. Cohen's touch was not. Oh, that was a direct attack, making the score to all. See, that's the parry to the head and the repose. Did you see that? Yes. Now it's three all, and they always change sides when one man has scored three touches. Are you ready? See that the man in the middle always says. Ah! Now the score is three all. You see, okay. use it up. Ready? Ready? Another parry. That's against Mr. Cohen. The score is four three. One more point. Best touch by Mr. Nita Kirchner, and that is the bow. What do you think of that, huh? Now, Joan and Jimmy, what did you think of all that? Well, it was pretty fierce, but they didn't do it like they do in the movies. Or in television. Well, no, they didn't. But you know, in the movies and in television, they rehearse these things in, this, in the sequence <coughs> with a lot of tables and chairs and stairs to make it all exciting. As a matter of fact, you know, we prevailed on a television star to show us just that kind of thing. Would you like to see it? Sure. All right, let's go. I wonder where that scarf would be. Ah! Oh, really, look at that. What is it? It's funny. Funny. You're doing the Who are you expecting, Tony you? Curtis? Oh, well, I'll tell you. Uh, I don't, can't really, but Michelle and I have cooked up a kind of a little um, routine as they might have in Hollywood. Now here's the setup, here's the scenario. Uh, it's in full color, of course, widescreen. You're trapped on a tower by a very evil prince, right? right. Now the evil prince's name is Michel Allo, right? And I'm the good guy. And this is the last three minutes of the picture, so I haven't got much time to, um, to save you. Are you ready? Ready! All right. Good luck, Sonny. Thank you. Yeah. 
Sonny, I'm afraid against a serious, good technique fencer would be any good. What do you think, oh, John Jimmy? I bet Sonny could beat him again. Yeah. Think so? I'll tell you what, I'll try it again. Trying my best. And Michelle, this time, you do it right. Okay? Oh, All right. And I'll call the touches. What do you think? Again, Sonny. Again, Sonny. Again, Sonny. Oh, my goodness. Oh! oh Sonny. Poor Sonny. You all right, man? Well, <laughs> I think so, yes. Michelle, thank you ever so much for showing us that it takes more than just bravado to be a good mm -hmm. and skilled fencer. And thank you, Miguel, Joe, Joe, for letting us come down here to the Fences Club and for all your compatriots who came down to help show us what a great, wonderful modern sport this is. We were delighted to have you, Sonny, and remember you too. I hope you come back often. And whenever yeah. you pick that foil up, have that mask, the glove, and the jacket on, huh? Right. right. Thank, thank you and good luck. Bye. Oh, little... Yep, I got it. Now, Joan and Jimmy, here I am, breathless again. Next week, we'll be at the uh, Mont Saint-Gabriel ski area up in the Laurentian Mountains oh in Canada. We're going to find out how to ski, learn from expert ski instructors. I know that neither of you have been on skis before, yeah. and me too. I haven't been on either, but we're going to find out how to do it, and we'll see some of the world champion skiers in action way up there in Canada. Incidentally, I just want to remind our friends about the fact that when they write to us with their suggestions for trips, they get this postcard with our picture on it. And Jordan, why don't you tell them the address to send it to? It's right there. Let's take a trip, 45 Madison Avenue, New York, 22, New York. Right. We'll be glad to receive any of your suggestions on places to visit. Incidentally, in two weeks, we'll be aboard the USS United States, the third largest ship in the world and the fastest. Right. Two weeks out in Los Angeles, a visit to the Boy Scouts out there, and our host for that day will be the movie star, Jimmy Stewart. So we have some exciting trips coming up. Plan on being with us next week. We'll see you up in Canada at Mont Saint-Gabriel for skiing. Bye. <laughs> Let's Take a Trip came to you today live from the Fencers Club in New York City. Right now, you want to know where Jack Benny's going? He's on his way to visit John Forsyth, better known, of course, as Bachelor Father. Actually, Jack's dropping by as a good neighbor to see if he can't help in the latest problem with niece Kelly, who's spending all her time at a neighbor's house. Laugh as Jack and John both turn detective to find out what's so interesting to her there when Jack Benny visits Bachelor Father tonight. Somebody else who has problems with children is Danny Thomas. Tomorrow night, he looks back over the days of his honeymoon, a honeymoon that wasn't as private as most since his wife's little daughter went along and his own son and daughter, too. Meanwhile, if you never thought words were fun, it's time you watched CBS television's fascinating program that takes the English language apart and then gives you the last word on how to put it together again. See the last word later today over most of these stations. <laughs>